the 1989 Eagle Summit and the 1990 Plymouth Laser are each equipped with a new four-speed automatic overdrive transaxle. The Summit is equipped with the KM176 four-speed automatic transaxle, while the Laser is equipped with the KM175 unit. The 1990 Plymouth Colt and Dodge Colt will be receiving the KM176 unit. The same KM175 transaxle will be fitted in the new 1990 Eagle Talon two-wheel drive. Hello and welcome to this month's special program. This combined videotape is designed to cover the operation and diagnosis of the Mitsubishi KM175 and KM176 four-speed automatic transaxles, which are in use in Eagle, Plymouth, and next year, Dodge vehicles built by Mitsubishi Motors and Diamond Star Motors. The 1989 Eagle Summit and the 1990 Plymouth and Dodge Colt models will be fitted with the KM176 transaxle. This transaxle is electronically controlled for optimum performance. The 1990 Plymouth Laser and the 1990 Eagle Talon two-wheel drive are equipped with a KM175 four-speed automatic transaxle. The entire unit is very similar to the KM176, but has an additional clutch disc in both the front clutch and the rear clutch and two more clutch discs in the low reverse kickdown brake. The reason for this is that the 135 horsepower 2 liter engine is more powerful than a 113 horsepower 1.6 liter version. The increase in power is about 25 percent, so the clutches were increased in strength more by about a third. The laser is also 1,074 pounds heavier. Let's now look at the major components. Everything is housed within this cast aluminum transaxle case and torque converter housing. This is a very compact four-speed unit. The hydraulic valve body operates close to the way most other valve bodies do. This unit, however, adds computer-controlled electronic solenoid valves which regulate upshifts and downshifts. In order, you'll find the B-shift control solenoid valve, the A-shift control solenoid valve, the damper clutch control solenoid valve, and the pressure control solenoid valve. The key to this transaxle is a planetary gear set of the Ravigno design. It includes a reverse sun gear, a forward sun gear, a carrier with two sets of three planet pinions, long and short, and an annulus gear. The friction elements which hold the various components are the front clutch, the rear clutch, the kickdown brake, the low reverse kickdown brake, an overrunning clutch, and the end clutch. This new end clutch is what actually provides fourth gear from essentially a three-speed gear train. Later in the videotape, we'll see just what happens inside the Mitsubishi KM175 and KM176 four-speed automatic transaxle. As was mentioned earlier, these transaxles are electronically controlled. The heart of the system is a small microprocessor called the Transaxle Control Unit, or TCU. The TCU is located under and behind the instrument center panel on all models. It is accessible from either side near the heater ducts. The TCU is independent from the engine control unit. It does, however, share some of the same electronic sensors used by the ECU. Here's a brief rundown of each sensor's basic function. The throttle position sensor, or TPS, is attached to the throttle spindle shaft here, 
for 1.6 liter Summit and 2 liter laser models. Regardless of application, the sensor is a potentiometer and it sends varying signals to the TCU regarding the angle of the throttle valve. The TCU requires information about the vehicle's speed to calculate the four shift points. The vehicle's speed read switch performs that function. The vehicle speed read switch is located behind the speedometer on all models. The speedometer's drive consists of a rotating magnet set spun by the speedometer cable. In close proximity is a glass tube under vacuum containing two flexible reed contacts. The switch remains closed until it reacts to the natural magnetic forces which occur very close to the two contacts. As the two repelling north poles pass near the switch, the contacts open. When the magnet set rotates 90 degrees, a north and a south pole pass nearby. The attracting tendencies pull the contacts closed. Then when the two repelling south poles pass nearby, their forces open the contacts. The fourth event occurs as a north and a south pole again pass near the switch. The attracting tendencies pull the contacts closed. As it opens and closes, a five volt circuit is grounded, then opened four times per revolution. The engine control unit counts these pulses and relates these data to vehicle speed. This is the signal used by the TCU. Engine RPM is an important factor for the TCU's shift decisions. This input is derived from the crank angle sensor mounted on the rear of the intake camshaft on Summit's 1.6 liter and Laser's 2 liter engine. The Laser's base 1.8 liter engine houses its crank angle sensor inside the distributor. The inhibitor switch performs three separate functions for the TCU. It is located in the same place on both models. The switch will only allow the engine to be started in park or neutral. It activates the reverse lights and it informs the TCU of the shift selector lever's precise location. The oil temperature sensor is located under the valve body on both units. This thermistor type sensor informs the TCU when the oil temperature is below 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees centigrade. In this range, the viscosity of the transmission fluid is thicker and it flows at a lesser rate. So the TCU can compensate for this by altering the normal operation of the pressure control solenoid valve until the transaxle warms up. This way, smooth operation is assured even when cold. When the oil temperature is in this range, the damper clutch is released to maintain good drivability. The air conditioning relay is also used by the TCU. On the summit, the relay is located in the left front relay bank. It's behind the left shock tower on the laser. The two round relays are the air conditioner relays. When the air conditioning is activated, this additional load on the engine requires a wider throttle opening to maintain the same road speed. This type of situation places the TCU in a position of trying to figure out why a stronger TPS voltage signal has not increased engine RPM. So the AC relay signal electronically explains this to the TCU. The next sensor signal comes from the accelerator switch. The accelerator switch is located at the top of the accelerator pedal linkage under the instrument panel on both models. It detects when the pedal is fully released at idle or during coasting. At idle, the TCU electronically places the transaxle in second gear. This eliminates excessive vibration and minimizes creep. The moment the pedal is touched, the switch opens and the TCU orders the transaxle to downshift to first gear. This is the kick down servo switch. It tells the TCU if the kick down piston is in use or if it's seated. During the upshift to second gear, the kick down brake is applied by the kick down piston. To avoid a slamming effect, 
The switch tells the TCU when the piston has moved, and the TCU reduces apply pressure to the kickdown piston via the pressure control solenoid valve to provide a smooth yet positive shift. This is the electronic version of a 1-2 accumulator. The driver may choose to operate the KM175 and KM176 transaxles as three speeds. An overdrive switch located on the shift selector handle can electrically lock out fourth gear operation. The laser has a similar switch. This would be useful on short trips around town. Then on laser models only, a power economy switch is another input to the TCU. The laser's TCU has two shift schedules stored in memory. The economy setting provides normal around town driving for maximum fuel efficiency. The TCU also uses this mode when the transaxle's fluid temperature is below 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees centigrade. The power mode expands the shift points to allow the engine to develop more revolutions and more horsepower prior to the next upshift. Two pulse generators feed internal rotational speed information to the TCU. They're in this same location on both vehicles. Pulse generator A counts the rotation of the kickdown drum and pulse generator B counts the speed of the transfer gear. These generators are serviced as a set. All the sensors and switches just mentioned are used by the TCU to calculate and initiate the four shift points as well as reverse, neutral, and park functions. Once the shift decision is made, the A and B shift control solenoid valves along with the pressure control solenoid valve are controlled by the TCU to change the hydraulic oil flow within the valve body. Aside from the fact that there are a few more hydraulic valves, this valve body operates very much the same as most other valve bodies on the road today. Understanding how these components interrelate can help you make a quicker diagnosis. In first gear, the rear clutch holds the input shaft and forward sun gear together. The overrunning clutch holds the carrier to the case. Power enters through the forward sun gear. The short pinions turn the long pinions, which then rotate the annulus gear. In second gear, the rear clutch is still applied to hold the input shaft and the forward sun gear together. The kick down brake is applied and holds the drum and therefore the reverse sun gear to the case. The forward sun gear turns the short pinions and the long pinions walk around the stationary reverse sun gear. The annulus is turned faster than it was in first gear. In third gear, the front, rear, and end clutches literally lock the gear set together for direct drive. In fourth gear, the front and rear clutches release and the kick down brake applies. The end clutch stays applied from third gear. The end clutch transmits power to the carrier. Since the reverse sun gear is held, the long pinions walk around it. This action turns the annulus gear faster to achieve the overdrive ratio. The KM175 and KM176 four-speed automatic transaxles require a detailed diagnostic procedure. A thorough diagnosis is critical to a fast, effective repair. Many times, a simple cable adjustment is the only action required. We can break the process into four areas. First, a complete repair order is essential. The service writer should note all customer comments and ask questions to get an even better look at the conditions under which the problem occurs. Second, perform a thorough visual inspection including a road test. Be sure the control cables are properly adjusted. Then look for loose connections, fluid leaks, and check the dipstick for proper fluid level, abnormal discoloration, and for a burned fluid smell. Well, the third step involves a method of obtaining any fault codes which may be stored in the TCU's memory. 
This procedure will be covered later in the program. The final step, pressure testing, will also be covered a little later on. The customer's vehicle is having a problem with second gear. Seems that the one-two shift slips and the engine runs up or races during the one-two shift. All other shifts are okay. This diagnosis will cover the broader approach, meaning what are all the possible factors which could cause this problem? Keep in mind that the laser and the summit utilize identical diagnostic procedures. In addition, the service manual can inform you on disassembly and assembly procedures. Perform a road test to verify the customer's complaint. Then perform the visual checks as previously mentioned. As a part of the visual inspection, check the level and condition of the fluid. If it's clean, the problem is likely to lay in the electronics, which may be indicated by a fault code. Well, now it's time to see what codes the TCU has stored. Connect an analog voltmeter to the diagnostic connector before switching on the ignition. Connect the leads to pin number 6 and to pin number 12. When you switch the ignition on, the meter will begin displaying fault codes. Count the slow and fast swings. 5, then 2, meaning 52. Fault code 52 indicates a problem in the pulse generator A circuit. It also could mean there's kickdown brake slippage. This could be caused by several things inside the kickdown servo. The pulse generator A's job is to inform the TCU about the kickdown drum speed. The drum is supposed to be stopped in second gear, yet the generator tells the TCU that it is not stopping soon enough for the prescribed shift parameters stored in the TCU's memory. So, the TCU thinks there's something wrong with the pulse generator A via code 52. That, however, is not the end of the road. So, I'll have to test the pulse generator A with an ohm meter. Disconnect the generator's four-way connector and test between terminals one and two. The required limits are between 215 and 275 ohms at room temperature. If the readout is either too high or too low, repair the wiring, the connection, or replace the generator. A faulty generator could be telling the TCU that the drum has stopped when in fact it is not. If, however, the tests are good, there's trouble deeper inside. The only way to find out from the outside is by a pressure test at the kickdown port. The kickdown port is located right by the servo. There are other ports for checking reducing pressure, torque converter pressure, and front clutch pressure. Atop, there are ports for low reverse brake pressure and end clutch pressure. Use the special oil pressure gauge, MD998-330, and the special adapter, MD998-332. You'll be testing only the shift into second. Be sure to write down the results. This test can be performed on the hoist. The kickdown port is accessible from above. But here's a cautionary note. Be sure to support some of the vehicle weight by the lower control arms. Because if you turn the axles with the suspension fully lowered, you may ruin from one to four CV boots. Remove the plug and install the adapter and pressure tester. Once the engine is warmed up and idling, shift into drive. In first gear, there should be zero pressure. The shift to second should provide a quick, positive needle response on the gauge to between 118 and 128 PSI. If your results were low, or the needle did not respond instantly, but did eventually reach pressure, then there's either an internal hydraulic pressure leak in the kickdown servo, or something sticking in the valve body. If you did get good pressure,
but an unacceptable shift during the initial road test, there is a chance of a failed kick down brake. But don't just replace the brake. Check the systems that apply the brake. It most likely didn't wear out without a little help. The most likely place from which hydraulic pressure escapes is within the kick down servo itself. A cut or scratched inner D-ring would allow kick down servo apply pressure into the release chamber. A cut or scratched outer D-ring or kick down sleeve O-ring would allow pressure to escape behind the sleeve. This type of leak would most likely be a visible external leak past the switch's snap ring. Let's get a better idea of how the one-two shift occurs. The one-two shift requires that two solenoids operate perfectly. The A-shift control solenoid is de-energized to block line pressure from exhausting into the pan. This builds line pressure to the shift control valve to move it. That opens a circuit to both the back of the one-two shift valve and to the pressure control valve. In first gear, the pressure control valve is closed against spring pressure by reducing pressure and the energized pressure control solenoid valve vents pressure control solenoid valve control pressure into the pan. In a functional transaxle, when the TCU calls for the shift to second, the pressure control solenoid valve is de-energized. This blocks the port and pressure builds to move the pressure control valve. When this happens, line pressure passes through the pressure control valve and to the one-two shift valve, which is now open. Line pressure then travels directly to the kickdown servo to apply it, thereby applying the kickdown brake to stop the kickdown drum. Then the shift to second mechanically happens. But in this case, the shift is too gradual. The pulse generator A tells the TCU about the drum speed. This is compared with the shift schedule. When the TCU realizes the kickdown drum isn't going to stop, it changes the duty cycle of the pressure control solenoid valve by de-energizing it. This allows all the pressure possible to the kickdown servo to apply the kickdown brake. The pressure control solenoid valve should be on and regulating the kickdown servo apply pressure during the one-two shift, not fully off. An electronic fault is stored when this does not help the slipping condition. If for any reason, either the A-shift control solenoid valve or the pressure control solenoid valve fails to fully seat, or the pressure control valve and one-two shift valve do not move freely, this slipping condition will occur. So, test the pressure control solenoid valve. Test the solenoid at the open connection using an ohmmeter. This solenoid, if faulty, could be causing the slipping one-two shift. Touch one probe to the number one terminal and the other to the case. The specifications are 2.9 ohms, plus or minus 0.3 ohms. If not within these strict specifications, then perform a direct voltage test. It is possible to have the proper resistance without proper hydraulic function. Apply battery voltage to the number one terminal. And listen for a clicking noise indicating operation. If you hear nothing, then it is either simply not functioning or it's clogged with foreign matter, such as aluminum chips. Don't forget a new filter. Now, since the complaint only involves second gear, you may assume that the A-shift control solenoid valve is functioning and seating. If it were not, then a problem would surface during the shift into fourth gear. So, let's check the valve body next. Remove the pan and check it for signs of friction material. A clean pan is a good sign, so you may proceed to check the valve body. If friction material is evident in the pan, this indicates a problem in the kick-down brake assembly. This will require removal and repair of the entire transaxle. Since this pan was clean, use a torque wrench to check the tightness of the valve body bolts. 
sufficient pressure may be escaping back into the oil pan to cause this problem. If they're torqued to specs, that means there is further investigating to do. Remove the valve body. Follow service procedures and carefully remove the four solenoids. Then inspect the pressure control valve. If it is free from abrasive marks, which would be caused by foreign matter, you may assume it operates freely. Try it in its bore to be sure of free travel. Then follow service procedures and remove the 1-2 shift valve. This valve may be sticking just enough to cause a problem during the 1-2 shift. Once in second gear, the 1-2 shift valve does not move again for the remaining upshifts. If it is free from abrasive marks, which would be caused by foreign matter, you may assume that it operates freely. Try it in its bore to be sure of free travel. To further familiarize you with the valve body, the upper valve body contains the pressure control valve, the torque converter control valve, the regulator valve, the shift control plug A, the rear clutch exhaust valve B, the rear clutch exhaust valve A, the 2343 shift valve, the 12 shift valve, the shift control valve, the manual valve, and the neutral drive control valve. The lower valve body contains the reducing valve, the neutral reverse control accumulator valve, the damper clutch control valve, and the end clutch valve, which is held in the valve body with a stopper. This should complete the possibilities for the slipping one, two shift. Reassemble the transaxle with a new filter, add 13 pints of Dexron II fluid, and road test the vehicle. The shift should now be normal. This new transaxle is far different from the standard KM171, and as such, its fourth gear overdrive deserves study. Its first gear ratio is 2.846, second gear is 1.581, third gear is 1.0, and fourth gear is 0.685. We are now assuming this is a healthy transaxle. Let's start in second gear to get a better idea. When in second gear, the rear clutch and kick down servo are applied. The end clutch valve is held open against spring pressure by second pressure. When the 2-3 shift begins, third pressure opens the 2-3-4-3 shift valve to apply the front clutch and the release side of the kick down servo. Third pressure is blocked at the end clutch valve by the pressure control valve by reducing third pressure below that of line pressure. Once the front clutch is fully applied and the kick down servo is fully released, the pressure control valve restores full pressure. This allows full third line pressure to apply the end clutch. We are now in third gear. This assures a smooth upshift to fourth. The kick down servo has both apply pressure and release pressure. Release pressure, however, acts upon a much larger surface area to assure that it is fully released. The A-shift control solenoid, B-shift control solenoid, and the pressure control solenoid valve are all off for full line pressure. When the 3-4 shift is initiated, the A-shift control solenoid valve energizes. This allows the shift control valve to send fourth pressure to the rear clutch exhaust valve and moves it to the right. This opens a circuit to the spring end of the 2343 shift valve to cut pressure to the front clutch and kick down servo release. The pressure from the front clutch and kick down servo release vents through the exhaust ports in the manual valve. At the same time, the rear clutch vents through the rear clutch exhaust valve. This is now fourth gear. Now, if you do need to replace a certain electronic component from the transaxle, check to be sure if there's a kit or replacement part available. Right. 
Don't just toss out the whole valve body just because one of the solenoid valves may be faulty. Also remember that the oil temperature sensor is a separate item too. The parts department will show you that there are separate part numbers for just about any part that attaches to the valve body. The service manual has all the information to perform removal and installation procedures of these various sensors throughout the transaxle. Well, that about wraps up the diagnosis of the Mitsubishi KM175 and the KM176 four-speed automatic transaxles. If you handle transaxle trouble from a diagnostic viewpoint, you'll have better results and more satisfied customers. I'll see you next month. But first, I should go on a little road test.